Council, uh, <laughs> would the clerk please call the roll? Council Chair Sherman? Here. Council Gouvernelli? Here. Council Jordan? Here. Council Lennon? Here. Council Sullivan? Councilor Swift Kayada? Here. Council Wall? Here. Uh, please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Sarah. Uh, first, I had the pleasure uh, last Wednesday night of attending the appreciation dinner for volunteers for the Portland Museum for the uh, museum at Portland Headlights. Um, it was held at the um, um, Higgins Beach Inn. Higgins Thank you, Beach. Higgins Beach Inn, and um, it was a delicious dinner. And the room was filled with people, which I'm always astounded by how many people volunteer at our museum and at the gift shop. Um, and it was just a great evening to see. People there are so gracious, and they actually um, end up thanking me for letting them volunteer for our town for free, which I always find interesting. They have great stories to tell about people they've met, not only from all 50 states, but from countries literally all over the world. They had the numbers on how many, um, and I can't remember, but it was truly amazing. Um, they are the connection to the world, or one of them, from Cape Elizabeth, and they put on a great face, and it's part of why we have such a good reputation. So. I just wanted to publicly thank them once again um, and to thank Jean Gross, who does such a, a wonderful job of managing um, the museum and all of her volunteers. Anybody else? I also had the pleasure of attending that same uh, reception at the Higgins Beach Inn. I went for the uh, cocktail hour, and then Sarah and I passed, and she went <laughs> for the dinner. I don't know what that says about me. but. In any event, uh, I echo everything Sarah just said. It is a wonderful, wonderful group of people. And again, I want to express my appreciation for all that they do for the town. Could, could, could I just clarify? The museum at Portland Headlight pays for the volunteer dinners, but not for the cocktail hour. <laughs> <laughs> so was it a cash bar? It was. Uh, yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, uh, this is the first uh, opportunity in our in tonight's agenda oh, for sorry, I have none. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. No problem. Taking up all the time here. Uh, it's just a quick financial report. I thought it would be uh, an appropriate time to do it as we just finished our audit and we've just uh, wrapped up the first quarter of the year. So I'll try to be very brief. Um, for the audit, the town, which includes, of course, both the municipal and school, just finished up the financial audit process for the uh, year that ended June 30th, 2011 ably conducted by the firm of Runyon, Kirsten, and Ouellette. We received an unqualified opinion, which means our financial statements are fairly presented and they're in order. Uh, the manager noted in his summary that, all of our, that our overall financial condition remains healthy. In 2011, the tax rate collection was 99.6%, which is very impressive. The unassigned fund balance is at a healthy 3.18 million. The ratio of bonded debt to assessed value decreased from 1.65% to 1.48. Uh, $2.1 million of the debt was retired last year. 81% uh, will be retired in the next 10 years and 100% in the next 20. Turning very briefly to the first quarter of this fiscal year, so far the year has been consistent with our expectations. Um, obviously, the weak economy isn't helping us, but um, good planning has resulted in reasonable ex expectations and solid outcome. Property taxes came in at 50% for the first quarter. For revenues, excise tax was up 5% over projection. State revenue sharing and building permits are on target. And investment income continues to decrease. We've earned only uh, $2,459 so far this fiscal year. Expenditures also continue according to plan. And the manager predicted in his summary that by June 30th will be about $300,000 above budget, $227,000 due to the overlay. Uh, needless to say, all this information can be found, and much more can be found on the town website under government and then the sub menu budget. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Any other reports or correspondence? Uh, uh, this is the first opportunity in tonight's agenda for citizens to speak on issues that are not on the agenda. So if anybody would like to speak to an issue that is not on tonight's agenda, we welcome your comments. Okay, seeing none. I would ask uh, Deborah Lane, the town clerk, to give us an election update. Great. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> a uh, reminder to residents that the upcoming election will be held on Tuesday, November 8th. Residents of Cape Elizabeth vote at the high school gymnasium, and the polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. I'd also like to share with you two important issues regarding registration and absentee balloting. During the last legislative session, the legislature passed some substantive changes to election laws. The first having to do with the elimination of voter registration on election day, also known as same-day voter registration. The legislature did pass this law. However, following that change, it was a citizen's initiative. So on November 8th, uh, residents of the state of Maine will be voting on this issue. Therefore, the current law stays as it is for this election. So in other words, if you'd like to register to vote, you may do so at the polls on November 8th. Uh, whether you uh, register at the polls or here at town hall before the election, Please remember that proof of identity and residency is, requirement, is uh, required. The second issue is absentee balloting. Uh, this is a change that will be effective for the November 8th election. The legislature has now established a cutoff for uh, voting absentee without cause or for any reason. So if you know right now that you're going to be away or if your preference is to vote by absentee ballot, the cutoff is three business days prior to the election, which is on Thursday, November 3rd. So again, please keep this in mind that if your preference is to vote by absentee ballot or you know you're going to be away, please keep that in mind. Um, also, if you're not registered to vote, this cutoff does apply. So if you need to register to vote and you think that you want to vote by absentee ballot, you also do need to come in uh, by that cutoff on Thursday, November 3rd. We do have the ballots available on the town's website and more information about these uh, law changes at uh, our website at www.capeelizabeth.com. Uh, Ann, you had a question? Yes, I have a question for Deborah. Um, Deb, on the absentee balloting, I understand that you wouldn't be able to, to come in and vote absentee in the three days before. Does that mean you would not be able to come in and request an absentee ballot during those three days? That's, that's correct. The November 3rd deadline applies to people coming in or requesting a ballot. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to yes, be sure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions on the election update? Uh, since Jessica Sullivan was not able to attend tonight's meeting, uh, I've asked Deborah to also give an update on openings on town boards and commissions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the time of year where the Appointments Committee invites uh, residents to apply for our various boards and commissions. We do have several openings this year. Arts Commission, Board of Assessment Review, Conservation Commission, Fort Williams Advisory Commission, the Personnel Appeals Board, Board Planning Board, Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, and the Zoning Board of Appeals. New terms will begin on January 1st. Applications and actual board descriptions, meeting schedules, etc., are on the town's website. You may apply online, and applications are due in my office by Friday, November 4th. So we do encourage interested residents um, to apply if you're interested. Uh, thank you, Deborah. The town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, David. I want to give a brief update on the Toss Memorial Library. Uh, there's been a number of um, plans, schematics that have been circulated actually over the last couple of years, uh, one of, about two years ago, one a few months ago. And from that, you know, we've gotten a lot of interesting comments, a lot of, a lot of excellent input from citizens in terms of certain things they liked about what we're looking at and certain things they didn't like. One thing that was clear, the, the, we had the, and I want to be very transparent on this because I, I just read something that was, was uh, interesting. Uh, and the S, we did get a construction estimate for what, what everyone saw in their tax bill in that newsletter, the schematic. That came back at $7.2 million for the construction portion of the library. Uh, you know, if you added, you know, the, the architectural services, the furnishings, the technology, uh, fundraising costs, all those different things, we were probably looking at something over $9 million. It was felt, I think, by everyone involved that that was 
above and beyond the amount that we really wanted to be spending. Someone just wrote a letter to the Cape Courier that said we ought to rethink the $40 million library. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So we have to rethink. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it, it, I just, you know, to, to have that type thing out there, you know, published in a newspaper that's delivered to every home in Cape Elizabeth, people are entitled to write what they want to, but there ought to be some basis for throwing numbers out. You know, and they led you to certain rumors they heard of people they talked to. You know, the construction estimate was 7.2 million. It wasn't 40 million. So, anyway, regardless of that, don't believe everything you read in every newspaper, and particularly in every letter to the editor, and particularly the comment section on the Press Herald. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the library, one of the comments was people were concerned about losing the green in the front, and they were concerned about losing the historical aspect of the buildings. And I've, I've just put at the council podium, and uh, we don't have the final from the architects what it looks for, but I do want to mention it here and briefly explain it to the council and, and hopefully in a way that everyone else will understand. Uh, and we'll get this posted as soon as we get it, it fixed a little bit. You can see I've written some notes on it uh, from the architects so that other folks can see it. We don't have a schematic yet of what it would look like, but it would involve keeping the green in front of the library just much as it is, you know, cleaning it up a little, keeping the Joni Benoit sculpture there. The front end of what old timers know as the Pond Cove School Annex, the, the, the biggest, widest part of the library in the front, it's wide, then it narrows up, that would be retained. So we'd still have the look of the old school on Scott Dye Road, which a lot of people have said they'd really like to keep under this scheme. Uh, Jay Sharm, our librarian, has been working on a two-story concept. The reason we're looking at two-story, one, it's less expensive, it will reduce that cost, and secondly, it takes up less of the footprint of, of the space. It was concerned with trying to maintain greenery, not overcrowding the schools, etc. And, you know, the, the, you know, they're going to look at different schemes, but the, the scheme as it now, as it now is, uh, you know, the front end of that building would be taken, everything else would be taken down, in the children's library and the young adult would be up on that upper floor of what's now the adult section of the library. There'd be, you'd, there'd be a, still a lobby entrance, not too far from where it is now. Uh, there'd be elevators, big improvement for people who can't get around the, el can't get around the, uh, the library. And in, in, to the left, as you go in the entrance, you know, where, the child where you sort of head over the children's, that would be the adult. But you wouldn't have this long corridor. It'd be much more of a mass right in back of the library. And, you know, the parking would be in, you know, much the area it is now that would expand over into the lot that we own, we own next door. Uh, the downstairs level, lower level, in the old annex portion, the historical society under this scheme, you know, still subject change, would take half of the basement. Right now they have a couple of small rooms. It'd be mechanical, there'd be storage. Nothing too, too meaty. There'd be the technical services. And then there'd be meeting space and all of that underneath what would be the adult section of the library. I think this is really making progress in a lot of the comments we've heard. Uh, there's still a lot of details to be worked out. But, you know, what, what I do want to do is make sure everyone's up, updated and that, you know, when there is information out there that we get it out to folks just as soon as we can. And particularly when, you know, when I, when I read something like the $40 million library, you know, we just got to make sure people understand it was never in the cards. It was never going to happen. I, you know, I, 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 I think there would be a, there wouldn't even be a, just one vote for it on this council. It would be, I think everyone's hands would go up real, real quick on that one uh, to vote against it. So anyway, I'm hoping that, you know, we're still listening to, to everyone. We're still trying to come up with plans. And this is one alternative for the council to look at and the rest of the public to consider. We'll, we'll try to get it posted on the website just as soon as we have a little bit more uh, information that has the right labels and other things. Uh, Ann. Thank you, Mike. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I'm just looking at this yep. little sketch for the first time. So, uh, I take it the lower level is a, a basement level. Is that correct? The, the lower level would be, uh, you know, the, the back end would be built up. It would be lower level. It'd be an elevator. It'd be a central core elevator going. Through. So there would be an elevator. It'd, it'd be an elevator. Not a, one of those. Chairs. No, no. There'd be an elevator that would cover both wings. There'd be a real elevator. Okay, that's good. That's of concern to me because I would want to yeah. make sure if this ever does get done that we have accessibility for people who 
Absolutely. might have mobility issues. Um, and I'm, when you said, I'm just, maybe you don't have to go into the details, but I'm surprised that you said it would be cheaper only because I was on the original study committee yep. about three years ago, and the conclusion for going for the one floor yep. was that that was cheaper because you didn't lose space for stairwells and elevators and stuff. So is it just because the whole design, other things in the design would have changed? Yeah, the other, yeah, we, we've pushed the architecture on that point. The other thing is that there's 10% less space in this plan than in the last one you saw. So it's a smaller it's a square footage. Reduction. Okay, thank you. <coughs> uh, Frank? I don't know, Mike, if you had said this already, but do we have a ballpark number what this would come in at in terms of construction costs? It, it would be less than the other, but and you have part of it, it's because you have 10% less space. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you, you expand less footprint. I, I hesitate. You know, I want to make sure numbers we say publicly are accurate numbers, and I don't, you know, I've been told it's less, I don't have an exact number. Okay. And still, we, you know, we're, at, at best, if, if you know, we, we came to a consensus of what this ought to be, the public support, we're still two years out, so. Right. I just, you know, the first time you mention a number, it get, kind of gets planted in everyone. And I already have mentions of numbers that have been mentioned before, so right. I'm trying to fall not into that trap. And I would assume that two, this two-story structure would be more energy efficient, so if some operating it costs would be, be lower, it would be. Sarah? So I just have a quick question to conceptualize this. You know how the one now is almost three floors because you walk in, then you go up, and you can also go down? I'm assuming this is just two? It's two. So when you walk in, all this is on the same level that I'm looking at here, the children, adults, young, et cetera. And this, you have to actually go downstairs or elevator to get yeah. to this. Is that correct? When, when, when you come in, you know, I think you'll sort of come in at a mid-level, and there'll be an upper level and a, and a lower level. I think you, you know, the final design is I think you're going to come in at the mid-level, and then there'll be an elevator there to go to either up or down depending okay. on where you want to go. Okay. But it'll be much more open, you know, it's, as you can see, there's a big box there. It's not a real tight area. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Mike, is that it? Yeah, so, you know, we, we may want to, may want to ask the council to meet sometime later this month because there's a lot of things going on and to see if, may, you know, if we have something more concrete for you and the trustees and others to look at. Okay. Uh, we can uh, try to set up a time to do that once we have the... Once we know we have something to show. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, the next item is a review of the minutes from our September 12th meeting. Is there a motion? Move to accept. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, the next item on the agenda, we have advertised a public hearing for Rudy's of the Cape uh, liquor license. Uh, for anybody who would like to speak to this issue, please come forward to the podium and identify yourself. Give us uh, your address in Cape Elizabeth or your affiliation uh, with this particular issue, and y you'll have three minutes for each speaker. Would anybody like to speak on this issue? And if there are others, if you wouldn't mind just lining up so we can try to keep the uh, public hearing moving forward. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Brown. I live on Starboard Drive. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm here is about the Cape Elizabeth, about the fees for vehicles coming in. Is that what we're discussing tonight? Actually, no, this is uh, the uh, liquor license renewal for Rudy's on the Cape. Oh, uh, if you okay. wanted to discuss uh, fees for the buses, that mm -hmm. is later in the agenda. Uh, we okay. don't have a public hearing, but there is an opportunity for public comment. Okay. Would anybody else like to speak, or would anybody like to speak on the Rudy's on the Cape liquor license? All right, then I will close the public hearing. Uh, why don't we see if we have a motion first, and then we could have discussion? Is there a motion? Sarah. I move we grant uh, Rudy's the liquor license as requested in our packet. I'll second. Okay, a motion's been made and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, I just want to point out we have received uh, uh, complaints uh, primarily from a neighbor of this business establishment, and I, I do see we have. Uh, Chief Neil Williams here, uh, and we also have received a report from the code enforcement officer. Uh, Chief Williams, I'm, I'm just wondering, is there anything else you might add to this? Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, let the council know that uh, over the years uh, that Rudy is, uh, Rudy's has been open as far as uh, this last uh, person that has leased it. Um, in 2008, um, I did meet with one of the residents, reference a uh, problem with the, the noise coming from the parking lot. Um, on uh, 2009, that would be May 2009, we were called there at 10 o'clock for uh, the neighbor that was awoken by um, a horn blowing on a motor vehicle and people outside Rudy's. When the officers arrived, uh, there were only employees there. They were inside and they stated that the horn blowing was from somebody that came out of Broad Cove. So there was no way to um, uh, corroborate that. Um, also, um, this past uh, September 24th, at uh, 9.50, we received a call. Uh, caller was upset that uh, people were outside the restaurant after the closing time being loud and causing noise, which was waking them up. Um, the officers responded, however, we were tied up on a domestic situation. And so uh, time was uh, delayed approximately uh, 35, 40 minutes before we got there. So we couldn't corroborate that either. So there haven't been, have there been any complaints related to uh, excessive alcohol consumption or something that would relate to the liquor? No, not alcohol consumption. I have had conversations, uh, several conversations with a neighbor um, concerning the noise outside and um, they also alleged uh, that they heard from another neighbor that there was some names of theirs being used uh, as people were driving away. Are there any other questions? Sarah. So, Neil, do you know what the closing time is for it on the week and weekends? It's 9 o'clock. Every night of the week? I believe it is. Any other questions? I mean, I, I do note that we have uh, the ownership of this establishment has changed, so essentially this is a, an application being filed by the new owners who I guess I would hate to make it uh, impossible for them to run a business when they have no responsibility for anything that's occurred before. So I'd be inclined to support the motion. And if I may state, yes. um, we, we get notified from Deborah when she gets a uh, application. And I, I was in the affirmative for the application because of the same reason. Um, we haven't seen these people yet or know what they're going, how they're going to run the establishment. So I had nothing really on them to really say negatively. Okay. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? And the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, the town manager mentioned to me before this evening's meeting uh, that he would like us to consider taking an item out of order. Uh, so we would need to suspend the rules uh, to take up an item that is not on the agenda. Uh, and in order to, it might be helpful for the council to hear what the item is. It, just for the council and the public, this can be real brief. Uh, the, the town has funds that we put out for investment and collateralized certificates of deposit. Uh, we, we get bids from different banks. One of the banks we got a bid from was People's United Bank, which is the old main bank and trust, which has been bought out by this bank. They gave us the best bid for investing $5 million over the next year. And that's not just the general fund, but other fund monies. The, the, the amount we'd re get from People's United Bank is $35,000. It was 0.7% was the rate. Uh, the next closest bid was TD Bank, and that would give us a return of $22,500. Their rate was 0.45%, for a little under half of 1%. So, you know, if, so what we need is a corporate resolution, which is in a standard form by the bank, that simply is on the public record that says you authorize the account to be open. That sort of gives the message to the auditors to check with that bank to do the confirmations of the amount there. So what I would request that you suspend the rules to take up the item, and then you take up the item, and you, you authorize the corporate resolution to be signed, which has the effect of allowing us to open an account at People's United Bank and earning uh, 13000 $12,500 more dollars in interest than would otherwise earn. So first we would need to have a motion to suspend the rules. I move that we suspend the rules. To second. Item out of order. And it's been seconded. Uh, any discussion? 
All those in favor of the motion? Okay. I, uh, before we actually get to the motion that my, the town manager has asked us to consider, I should disclose that my law firm does represent People's United Bank. Uh, so given that, I probably ought to recuse myself from this discussion. Do I need a vote of the council for that, or may I just? Usually there's a consensus right. if that's okay. Does anybody have any concerns or issues with that? If not, I will uh, turn this over to Sarah Lennon to uh, run this portion of the meeting. Uh, okay, so let's start with a motion. <clears throat> We're looking for is a motion to authorize the town manager, uh, the town treasurer, to open an account at People's uh, United Bank and to sign the corporate resolution so, uh, required to do so. So moved. So moved. So Second. seconded. <laughs> Discussion? Mike, I don't know uh, anything about People's United, but I assume that A, it's credit worthy, and B, what, what is the question? What's the collateral on the CD? It's fully collateralized. By what? By uh, federal securities. Yes. <laughs> Any other discussion? And is this, uh, is this a one year arrangement? What, this is, uh, the term is one year. One year. From the date it's. From, yeah, we would hope, you know, within a day or so of, of uh, making, having this take effect. And no penalties from pulling it from another. No, the, the previous CD matured. It did mature. Uh, we, get, we got these bids on Friday. Great. No further discussion? All those in favor? And I, I do want to thank that. The reason we took it up then, we were afraid we might forget it, and then we'd lose the month's interest and, as the night went on. So thank you for doing that. The next item is uh, number 129, 2011, are the Arboretum at Fort Williams Park. Uh, the Arboretum at Fort Williams Park has recently revised their master plan. They are asking for approval of the master plan and authorization for the town manager to apply for permits for sites along the cliff walk. And we have some representatives here tonight uh, from the Arboretum Steering Committee uh, who will give us about a 10 minute presentation, I understand. And I understand there was also a site walk uh, this e earlier this evening at 515. A cold site walk. So. Anyway, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I am Lynn Schaefer. I live in Cape Elizabeth at 650 Shore Road. Tonight, I'm here representing the Arboretum at Fort Williams Steering Committee. As a member of that committee, I've led the effort to develop a full master plan for the Arboretum, which was just distributed to you hot off the presses today, and um, still in draft form, but mostly complete. The first step in the process to develop the master plan was to review the site plan which you had originally approved. For a variety of reasons, we felt it was best to eliminate some sites and add others. Tonight, I ask you to review and approve the revised site plan. We are bringing this to you now because we are beginning a major fundraising effort and a complete current master plan will be an invaluable tool in the process. I'm also asking for your authorization to apply for any necessary permits to proceed with work within the shoreland zone, in particular those sites along the cliff walk. We do not yet have funds to develop those sites but we would like to be able to work with the town to start to control invasive and aggressive plants growing there. Before I talk about the revised site plan though, I'd like to update you on our progress developing the first site, cliff side. This slide shows the plan drawn for us by landscape architects Terry J. Dwan Associates with Bruce Riddell. 
groundbreaking took place in July after volunteers had worked hard for many months on numerous work days to clear and face of plants. To date, phase one has been completed. That means that we have cleared invasive species, excavated to remove roots and expose ledge, sculpted the land to achieve sustainable slopes and accessible pathways, laid in stone dust base for the pathways, laid in mulch and planted grass. You can see the way water views have been opened. Originally approved sites are shown on this plan in orange. Much of the parkland is protected, but it's not clear that the southernmost area shown shaded is. For that reason, the five sites there are shown with an X through them. We prefer to include sites for which there will be no questions raised when it comes to fundraising. In other areas, original sites have been adjusted or absorbed into larger sites. The revised sites are shown in green. This plan shows only the revised sites, but also shows proposed walking loops. These loops follow existing walkways, with one exception, between the Chapel Road entrance furthest to the north and the main entrance. In determining the sequence in which to develop sites, we looked at the complexity of the sites and the skills needed to design sites. Four sites, the fruit orchard, shade garden, edible nut grove, and tree succession sites will require much less work than the other sites and can probably be constructed simultaneously with some of them. The sequencing favors the most visible sites and those for which funding has already been promised. After Cliffside, we propose to start with the Cliffwalk entrance site and the Cliffwalk promenade site. Not only are these highly visible sites, but clearing them out as quickly as possible will help preserve the work we have done on the cliffside site. At the end of the cliff walk is the lighthouse view site. We propose to design this site simultaneously with one of our newly proposed sites, the crossroads site at the opposite end of the green. So they can bracket the green, in each case addressing the transition from manicured lawn to naturalized landscapes. Next to the playing fields, we have discovered old apple trees in dense overgrowth. <coughs> this would be another new site. We would like to clear the invasive plants and plant heirloom varieties of fruit trees, creating an orchard. In the area of the pond, we want to divide the one original site into two, the pond as a site for aquatic plants, and above the pond, a children's garden where children can explore along the paths and play on the lawn, which could incorporate a maze. The Rotary Club is eager to help us develop the children's garden. At the short road end of the parade ground is a thicket of trees which already demonstrates characteristics of tree succession. This provides a good teaching opportunity. Trees along the entry road provide an opportunity for a shade garden. The Road at Entrance Society is eager to help us develop the entrance to the fort by providing rhododendrons to be sited under trees and on the slope, as well as financial assistance. At the Chapel Road entrance, furthest north, stone steps lead through dense thickets of invasive plants to a perch on top of a large rock, 
overlooking where the chapel once stood. We propose this as a new site to be called Meditation Point. It would help draw visitors to a rarely seen corner of the park, one that is now heavily infested with bittersweet and other invasives. <laughs> Closer to the Goddard Mansion are huge oaks and shagbark hickories. We would like to clear bittersweet, which is strangling trees here, and plant more edible nut trees. This would be an opportunity for an eighth grade class to plant a tree each year, something they could come back to year after year. The thicket below the Goddard Mansion was probably planted as a windbreak. We see clearing out undesirable plants and reinforcing the alley of oaks and maples which already exist along the road back to Battery Keys. At Battery Keys, another proposed new site, we would like to attack the bittersweet that is overwhelming the area on the water side of the battery and design a more welcoming area in front of the battery, something that appears to be part of the Fort Williams Master Plan revision. That concludes my presentation. I hope you will join Fort Williams Charitable Foundation and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission in approving our revisions. And I hope you will authorize us to apply for permits to assist the town in working to control invasives and aggressive plants along the cliff walk. Catherine Bacastow and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you both. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Frank. Thank you for, uh, for this and all the work you've done on it. The only question I have is, as the, the council starts to consider various uh, possible commercial uses or commercial opportunities in the park, whether it's the food carts we have now or potentially large uh, gatherings <coughs> like weddings and so forth, do you see anything that's been discussed thus far being in conflict with some of the ideas you have for the park? I don't. Okay. Um, the one place where we've looked at uh, a possible conflict is the site at the very end of the cliff walk above the lighthouse because there are food carts there now and we have no intention of interfering with that. We think it's totally compatible. And in fact opportunities may be created in these spaces um, to be able to find uses which could be revenue producing. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very impressive, uh, the work you've done so far. And again, thank you for all of your work on this. Thank you. Uh, we did not advertise a, a public hearing this evening, but if anybody would like to speak uh, to this particular issue, you're all welcome to come forward. And we can give you up to three minutes if you'd like to offer commentary. OK, uh, Jim. Uh, David, could, could we um, ask Bill Nickerson, the chair of the Ford Williams Advisory to speak to the issue. We're working on a master plan for the entire park, and I think that his group has been pretty immersed in that project at the moment. We had a public hearing on the 21st, and I think, Bill, maybe if you could just, this is all consistent, if you could just validate, you know, what the commission has been working on and how, how commensurate they are with one another relative to our future plans for the park. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, raising that, Jim. Good evening. I'm Bill Nickerson, 3 Thompson Road. Um, we've been working very closely with um, the Arboretum Steering Committee. John Mitchell, who is overseeing the master plan revision for the master plan of all of Fort Williams, is also very involved with the Arboretum Steering Committee. There's a coordination that John naturally brings to that. Um, what I would see, and we haven't talked about this in detail, but I would expect that, um, that the uh, Arboretum Master Plan would be incorporated by reference into the overall Master Plan of Fort Williams Park so that, I mean, the trails that, that Lynn described and um, other aspects of their, their work are compatible with what John has been talking about. And there's nothing 
to answer your question, Frank. Um, there's nothing there. They are planning for any area within Fort Williams which is incompatible with a site location for, for example, a picnic shelter mm -hmm. or a wedding reception location or anything else. So we've been working very closely together, and I think it's a very compatible um, uh, design in terms of what we're doing. Are there any other questions for Bill while he's here? Oh, that's great. All right. Uh, but somebody, thank you very much, and thank you for all your work on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Bill. Uh, do we have a motion? Jim. Uh, I move that we accept the, um, the Arboretum Fort Williams Park uh, revised master plan update and request that the town manager apply for the necessary permits for sites along Cliff Wharf and um, I think that encompasses pretty much what they're asking for. Okay. Is there a second? Second. The okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion, comments? Okay, all those in, in favor of the motion? Yeah, the motion carries. Thank you again. Thank you. And good luck with your fundraising. <laughs> Great. Uh, item number 130-2011. This is Fort Williams Park fee for commercial transportation vehicles. Uh, the town council had a workshop on October 3, 2011. Uh, and in our materials, we have a recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, and I believe what we ought to consider doing is setting this for a public hearing for Monday, November 14th. Uh, before we actually entertain a motion, I do recall at the beginning of this evening there was a gentleman who wanted to speak on this issue. Uh, uh, there he is. Uh, so again, we have not. We are going to have a public hearing next month, but if you wanted to speak tonight, you are uh, welcome to do so, or, or anybody else. We we do a lot under the town council rules, up to 15 minutes. Uh, for, okay, please come up to the podium and. Uh, Introduce yourself, state your address or your affiliation uh, with the town, and we welcome your comments. Betty Crane, <clears throat> 9 Starboard Drive. And I first want to thank um, Bill Nickerson and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for the very, very fair report they gave on uh, having bus fees in Cape Elizabeth, and you have it, of course. And uh, aside from that, the only issue that I see is that no way are the citizens of Cape Elizabeth morally wrong in charging the buses. Uh, just because we have a free park that people can come in and visit. Anybody in the world can come. But the people on the buses have elected to be taken to the park, leave the driving to us. They want to be dropped off right at the foot of the lighthouse. They don't want to have to make any arrangements. They just buy the tour because they have a desire to see probably the loveliest lighthouse in the world, Portland Head Lighthouse. And they get, the bus drives them in, they've paid for this, but it's been voluntarily for them. So we have no moral obligation to not charge the buses. The buses are setting up a tour that is appealing to the public, and the public is buying the tour, and the bus is making money on the tour. It's as simple as that. There's no conflict between a family driving in and a bus full of tourists who want to be in an easy position of seeing the lighthouse, the views, the museum, the shop, thoroughly enjoying themselves. So I think the, uh, what the foundation, uh, the, not the foundation, excuse me, the, uh, excuse me again, I'm getting rid of them, I hope, tomorrow. Uh, good. Um, I think what the uh, Advisory Commission has done has been very, very fair. They've allowed um, no charge for the
the school buses that come and the rec program and so forth. You know, you know the if, whole if thing. You're coming up. You've anyway. read it. You it's could... a good, fair plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue? Yes, sir. I guess I misread the paper because I thought it was the hearing was tonight, too. That's okay, but you're welcome to speak. I urge the council not to put any more fees and respect the citizens' votes. It seems so every time we turn around, this council's trying to cram it back down for a vote. Maybe they're trying to wear us out, but when we voted no fees the last time, commercial vehicles and things was involved and discussed well, and the people represented well in their votes. So I, I, I think that the council should be listening to that. I think you've got other ways to make fees. One councilor made reference to them heavy buses staving up the road. Them roads have been there a long time. I don't think the town spent much money on them. And they've been going in and out. This council found money to pave state-maintained roads like Route 77, so I guess we should be able to find a little money to pave Fort Williams if we needed to. you got a historic lighthouse there, people coming from all over. I don't think that you should be charging them. You're going to say the buses are paying, but they're going to pass it on. The people's vote said they didn't want it, but yet every time we turn around, we're faced with it. I think you got other ways for revenue. That little garage is grossing that kind of money. Maybe we should build an addition on it. Maybe we should be looking at the revenue. If we're grossing 500000 and only Net in 77, why well, maybe we better be, well, I don't know what percentage we mark stuff up. We got volunteers, but it's a long gap between 500,000 and 77,000. Uh, I think there's a lot of things like that that you can use. We got a nice fort there. Yes, it could be better. But the general feeling, you know, talking with the people is just nice. And we'd like to have everybody be able to enjoy it, whether they come in by bus or what. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Again, if you uh, speak, if you could just introduce yourself and give us your address or your affiliation, please. I'm Bill Enman. I live at 58 Spilling Avenue. Been here before. Talked about the same thing. Uh, I think that uh, Herb was right. The previous person, uh, the town has voted, and I think that this is getting ridiculous. That every uh, year we have to come out here and vote again. We voted. It didn't say personal vehicles or anything else. We said no fees. I don't know how much plainer it has to be because if we have to keep doing this every year, till I die, I'm going to be here. The people of this town have spoken. They spoke very clearly. So I don't know what the problem is here. Evidently, there's a lot of people on this committee that don't want to hear the town and don't want to go with the, the population of this Town. But I, I think it's ridiculous that uh, this keeps coming up. Uh, as far as income goes in that, in the fort, uh, who says we have to go through all this beautification and all this stuff? The people of this town are happy the way it is. It seems to be some of you board members who think this has to be like the like the public works building that we call the Taj Mahal because we don't need it. The kids play over there and they love it the way it is. So I'm just asking you to think this through and just keep remembering. We voted no fees. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, go, I'm sorry. <clears throat> My name is Paul Brown. I live in Starboard Drive. You probably remember me. I was here a few minutes ago. Uh, Betty and Bob Crane are neighbors of mine, friends of mine, and I can't tell you how much I fear disagreeing with Betty. <laughs> she'll, she'll pick at me tomorrow morning. But, I, uh, <clears throat> but I'm one who, who like this, these fellows before me there, that can't believe that this is up for a vote again, or this is you know, even on the table. Uh, Everybody I talk to, the first thing that, you know, what is it about no, they don't understand? What are we doing wrong in our voting here that we say by a three to one margin, two to one margin, no, no fees. Comes back and comes back. Uh, <clears throat> it keeps, somebody said this, I won't take credit for it, it keeps popping up like an unstaked vampire. 
And, uh, but I have a little different take on why we shouldn't have fees for the buses. And, you know, we don't, we, we don't put a charge on the buses, on the machine that brings people in. The charge is going to those people, even though they may live out of state, probably may never come back, because the bus company is going to raise the fees, and the reason is that Cape Elizabeth now charges for the park. No question about that. Uh, <clears throat> but my feeling is, I love being in Cape Elizabeth. I love being in an incredible town like this that's incredibly run, by the way. And I have great respect for all of you. I could never sit up there and do this job. Wouldn't want to, because I got you guys to do it. Uh, so I know you know what you're doing. And I know you know about money. I sure know about money and, and revenue. But I would like to see un Cape Elizabeth. I think it's a unique town in many ways. And I want it to be unique as far as Fort Williams is concerned. I want it to be a free park. And it's, it may cost some money, but that, that's the thing we're going to hear, and I expect that, like the last time. And if there's, I talked to so many people, Betty's one of them, the, the people in my neighborhood, and they say, bring it on. I'm raising taxes, we can handle that. And I know that's easier said than done when the bill comes in. But I'm sure if you, if, if you polled everybody in Cape, your taxes are going to go up $10 a year. You're going to have to pay 100 whatever it is. Bring it on. Because we want that place to be free. We want Cape Elizabeth to be unique. I wish there were adjectives for unique, but there isn't. My English teacher would turn over in her grave. But if there was, it would be incredibly unique, amazingly unique, to have a park that stays free, not a little bit free, a two-thirds free, but free. And I saw some people up there a few days ago, young guys uh, messing around up there, and I was just so glad. I know they didn't have 10 cents between them, probably, but they were playing in Fort Williams, and I like it. And I want us to stay special. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, about three or four minutes left for this 15-minute allotment. I see we have two speakers, so come on up to the podium. <laughs> Maybe if you could leave a little time for the last gentleman. That would Harry be Hardy, Six Tiles Road. I've lived in the Cape for, I think, 41 years, and I'm speaking strictly as a taxpayer. Some of you know I spend a lot of time up there, a great deal of time. I have some concerns about charging for the buses. One is I do think it will neg negatively affect the revenues in the gift shop, and I think significantly. A lot of the buses that come out there, uh, you know, from the cruise ships will probably continue to come. But there are a lot of independent mom and pops. You know, dad drives the bus, and mom, you know, does the, serves as the hostess and the guide. And a lot of those independents, I think, once you hit them with a fee, whatever it is, they'll find some place else to go. Maybe they'll go down the two lights and create a traffic jam, you know? But I think a lot of them will stay out of the park. Uh, as far as this, this charge and the buses only, the vast majority of the people who use the buses are senior citizens. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a a cover charge to senior citizens. Now, I don't know about any of you. I haven't been in, in a place that, that charged a cover charge for years, but when I did, it wasn't to go buy a trinket. And, and I don't think we should be charging senior citizens. Uh, the, the average bus, those people stay there maybe 15, possibly 30 minutes. You have people that come into the park who are not charged, who are there in the morning at 9 o'clock, and they're still there at 8, 8.30, whenever you close, and I think they have a far greater impact on the park. I love the fact that it's open to dogs, but I, I think the dogs and the dog walkers have a far greater impact. The town takes hundreds of pounds of dog manure to the dump every week, and we pay for it by the ton. And I think that's an impact, and, and I don't think we charge them. I don't think we should charge them, but I don't think you ought to be charging the seniors. Uh, and the last thing I've got to say is, is sort of like what some of the others said. You know, it's come before the council. I feel like I'm involved in a game of whack-a-mole. Remember the little game you bought your kids? You know, and they banged on the thing and it went down and another one popped up. That's what, I, that's what I'm beginning to feel like, that I'm just involved. It's useless. You know, keep beating on the thing. It won't die. It won't go away. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. We have just a couple minutes, sir, if you'd like to speak. Hi, everyone. Greg Gordon, 110 Two Lights Road. Um, 
I grew up here in Cape Elizabeth. I've come back to live here in Cape Elizabeth, and I also work with all the cruise ship buses, and, and the reason why a lot of you guys might have concerns with the volume buses that are coming in here into Cape Elizabeth. Um, with that said, I think that the, it needs to be fair, and if you're gonna be charging for buses, at the same time you should be charging for cars and making it equitable across the board. Um, I think there's other revenue sources that can be done, expanding the gift shop, having more cash registers, putting a couple of cash registers outside when you have some, some volume that comes through, and that's a huge revenue source that can be done. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I look forward to talking to you next time around. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the public comment uh, for this uh, particular item. Uh, is there a, uh, essentially what we need to decide tonight is whether to set this for a public hearing for the November meeting. So do I have a motion? Yes, Ann. I move that we um, set this for public hearing for Monday, November 14th. And after it's seconded, I'd like to speak to the motion. Sure. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Ann? Um, I, I don't want to get into a, a long-winded response here, but I, um, I speak as someone who, and I hadn't intended to speak tonight because I thought we'd just be caring, so I'll be short, but um, I speak as someone who was in favor of parking fees for vehicles, and um, I am glad that it went to public vote twice because I think that sort of settled it definitively. Uh, so even though I was sympathetic to fees, it was a proponent of fees on all vehicles. Um, I will, when this comes up next time, will not be supporting fees on buses for a variety of reasons. And I don't think that it's intrinsically fair to charge people, and they will be charged by the fees being fast, uh, passed through, to charge people who come in one way to the fort as opposed to another way. I've heard that there's commercial vehicles that are being charged and they're making a profit and so that, you know, it, it, that makes it different. Well, we don't charge people who come in, arrive by taxi cab. Now, there probably aren't very many, but if somebody caught a taxi cab down when they got off one of the cruise ships and they rode in on a ca taxi cab, we wouldn't be charging them. And yet, we'd be charging the people who come on the tour buses. I do think tour buses are, uh, tend to have an a more senior citizen as the average customer. And um, so I think it is, I, I really like the comment about it's a, a surcharge, a cover charge on senior citizens. I, I really think that's what it's going to be in effect. And I don't understand the logic of charging, of letting the vast majority of people who come in by car, who probably put much more of the use and the wear and tear on the floor, letting them in for free, not charging them for parking, and I think that charging buses somehow sounds like it's going to generate a ton of money. I don't think it will. And I think it's um, got a lot of practical problems about collecting the bus fees. But ultimately, I think it's inherently unfair. So I just wanted to respond to some of the comments. And we'll wait for next time, too. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak before we vote? Yes, Sarah. I just have a quick request. Can we have the wording that was actually on the referendum last time, or better yet, both times? Because I had recalled that it said, do you favor parking fees for Fort Williams? And I just, I, I, it, to me, it would be very helpful next month if, I, if we could see that ahead of time. Sure, it, I'm sure it we was, it. it was parking it was fees. That's what I thought. But it did, I think it said vehicle parking fees or parking fees. Whatever, I just, because people keep it. saying we voted oh. no on all she's fees. Got and yeah, she's got it. I, I, was interested in the exact same thing, so Deborah helped me find it oh, what is online. It? And it said, would you favor the town establishing a pay display parking program for Fort Williams Park? That's the, oh, that's the 2010 version. In 2006, it was worded as um, for non-residents. So it was pay display for non-residents. And so we changed, essentially it's the same question, just taken the non-residents part out for the 2010 vote. Thanks. And the pay, just for people who may be watching, the pay display system is a parking. It was a parking fee, parking not program. an entrance fee. Okay. Any this, yeah. And this, as I understand it, is a parking fee because I don't think we're talking about, maybe I'm wrong, if a bus just drove through and didn't stop, I don't think we're talking about charging them. I don't know. Uh, that's my understanding, but uh, would anybody else like to speak on this? Uh, 
I guess I would interpret it as a usage fee because they're neither parking nor are they just passing through. They're using the resource in the park, and that's how I think about it. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to the discussion next month. Um, I just <laughs> <laughs> You may be, uh, you may be the quick, only one who's looking forward to no, it. But to, to address the, the, why, the question of why is this coming back up again, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has recommended it. They gave it a lot of thought. And we have to respect that group of people who serve as volunteers in that commission. Uh, we, in my view, whether I'm in favor of this or not, I, I don't happen to be. Uh, but I feel like we should respect that commission. Uh, have a public hearing and then have, have a vote on it. So I, I, I appreciate the sentiment that I've heard. You know, why is it back here again? But I, I do need to explain my rationale as to why I think and we need to get it back. Frank. I think you, you should just um, clearly state this is a council vote. We're not suggesting it's going to referendum again. I, I, what I heard sounded like some people thought it was going to referendum again. No, this, uh, that's my understanding. Uh, this is, uh, I certainly would not favor another referendum vote. Yeah. Uh, um, I, and I just wanted to speak to what you mentioned a minute ago. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission put this together, and we are dealing with it because they brought it to us. But it was at the council's request to look for revenue sources, all sorts of revenue sources. So I don't want to sort of yeah. put this on them because they they were just doing responding to our request to try and figure out ways to generate money to help support Fort. I, I agree with that as well. Jim. Dave, well put in terms of the advisory council and also in, again, clarifying the purpose that we asked them to look at the question. I, you know, again, if we're going to have the information about what was in those two referendums, I think that would be really helpful. And secondly, I'd like the demographics on all the cruise ships. They're not old people. I mean, the average income coming off these cruise ships is over $100,000. And I don't believe it's old people. I think that it'd be very helpful for us to understand what the demographics are. Because to make the leap that everybody on a bus is somehow senior citizens is something that I'd like to have some clarification and some facts so that I'd be in a better position to understand. Uh, I agree it would be helpful to have information, but I believe I said people who come on tour buses, not just the ones who come but on cruise ships. Right, but tour but I, bus companies it would probably be have the demographic helpful. too. It would be helpful. So it would be helpful for information, us to have facts, I mean. yeah, that's all. I, I'm sensing that members of the council can't resist to uh, no, debate this issue now. No, no, I'm Sarah, not gonna, go ahead. I'm not going to say my opinion or anything. I just have one more request because all we're trying to do is gather data and we Correct. should take credit for that. I would also like to know if it's possible or attainable um, from some of these tour bus companies where else they stop and are they charged for that destination or not. I personally think that would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Uh, it's, I don't know if the gentleman who, yes, from the tour bus company is here, so perhaps you can address that next month. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Uh, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion? All right. So we will have a public hearing November 14th on this issue. Thank you all who came out this evening to speak. I will try to meet between now and then with, I see a number of folks here from the industry, to, to talk to them again and to see you know, what information they are willing to provide. You know, it's, they're private businesses. And, but we will try to get as much as we can that might be helpful. OK, thank you, Mike. Uh, item number 131, 2011, uh, uh, is Fort Williams leases. Uh, Greg Marles, who is our facilities manager, has been meeting with prospective tenants of rental spaces within the fort. And Mike, perhaps it would just be useful for you to Very briefly, introduce this. Yes. Just, I want to say two things, three things. One is I really want to thank Greg for his persistence in trying to get this building rented. Uh, it's been empty for a couple of years, and uh, it's uh, not, never good when a building's empty. A building needs to be used to survive. Uh, this would be the first time they'd be rented to other than not-profit uh, entities. Uh, I think the tenants that he's found are both Cape Elizabeth resident-owned, uh, just, uh, you know, people, well, one we know, one, one, one graduated high school with me, in fact. I uh, shouldn't reveal her age, but uh, uh, the, the other one, uh, uh, you know, se seems like a reasonable business. But really want to praise Greg. It's not the whole building. Uh, it's only part of it. The other thing I would like to say is that this uh, still needs to go back, will go back to the Fort Williams Committee for one final look, because they haven't specifically looked at these tenants. And, but we're they're meeting next week, is it? 
yeah, we, we're hoping to do that so we can, we can give the final affirmative answer to, to these tenants. So would you be seeking a motion to authorize you to enter into this lease pending uh, the meeting with the Fort Williams <clears throat> Advisory Commission? Uh, I am asking uh, that we offer proposed leases to these entities, but we won't sign them until we get the, uh, uh, they've already signed it, but I, I want to make sure that the Fort Committee has also signed off on it. Okay. I, I always hate them having veto power over the council, so I'm, I'm looking, you know, I, I assume there'll be an affirmative answer, but yeah. If, if they don't approve it, I, I still make them back and ask you to approve their advisory, but I think they'll, they'll, they'll like these leases. Greg's done a good job. Okay. And uh, Greg is here and I thank you for your work on this as well. Uh, do I have a mo Well, is anybody here who would like to speak us to this, on, on this issue? Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, Frank. Move to, to approve um, the leases as presented uh, to uh, the council by the facilities manager. Okay. Second. A, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number 132, 2011. This is a planning board growth area recommendation. Uh, by way of background, in June of 2011, we requested that the Planning Board consider the possibility of rezoning Turkey Hill Farm and the Lovett Airs <coughs> parcel from the RB Growth Area Zone to the RA Zone. And we've received a memorandum from the Planning Board recommending that the zoning for the two parcels not be changed. Uh, at this point, we need to decide how we're going to proceed, whether we wish to set this for a public hearing next month to consider this issue or consider some other option. Uh, I don't know if anybody has questions. Public input? Uh, is anybody? Uh, actually, we have a member of the planning board here. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Elaine, would you sure. be willing to uh, come forward and give us a, a bit more background on the issue? I'm Elaine Ballander. I live at 16 Mayors Hollow Lane, and I'm here as chair of the planning board. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because of our new, the new procedure that the council adopted earlier this year that said that when the council makes a recommendation to the planning board, someone will come from the planning board and explain it. And the same way, when the planning board reports back to the council, we'll have a representative come and, and give you some of the background on our thinking. So that's what I'm here to do tonight. You all have um, a memorandum that sets out in some detail what our thoughts were. I think rather than going over it, um, I can be pretty brief here. Both of these parcels, Turkey Hill Farm and the Lovadares parcel, as they currently exist with their current ownership and restrictions, are not parcels which could be developed. The Turkey Hill parcel is subject to deed restrictions um, that could not be removed without consent of a lot of people who are the beneficiaries of those restrictions. The Lovett Ayers parcel is owned, as I understand it, about 99% by the town and currently functions as the terminus of some of the Stonegate trails as a practical matter it's really not subject to development, although there really are no restrictions on what the town in some future year might do. That being said, um, looking at the proposal to change the zoning of those properties, it seems as though changing the zoning only makes sense in the context of anticipating that because of some change to these current deed restrictions, at some point someone might consider developing the parcels. If these parcels at some future unanticipated time were proposed for development, it seemed to the planning board that the town's interest would be in having as much ability to preserve open space on those parcels as possible. That's what the comprehensive plan calls for and that's certainly what the current use would indicate. Looking at the zoning ordinance, it's a little bit surprising if you look at the names of the various sections of the zoning ordinance, but actually the portion of the zoning ordinance that gives us the greatest control to preserve open space for the town is the RB zone. 
And all the, although the RB zone is called the growth area, it in fact provides the most open space protection because it says that in the RB zone and not in the other zones, if there is a proposed subdivision, there must be a certain percentage of the land preserved for open space. In the RA zone, which has a bigger individual lot size requirement, there is no requirement for preservation of open space. Same thing in the RC zone, which has the smallest lot, lot size requirement. So it is only in the RB zone, under the current zoning ordinances, where the planning board can consider provisions, and in fact is required to consider provisions that would result in significant open space being preserved for the town. And in, if you look at the development that has occurred in the town over the years, in fact, quite a bit of our current open space has resulted from those very requirements. So it seemed to us that the best thing for the town is to keep these parcels zoned the way they are. And thus our recommendation that we leave things as they are. Uh, thank you, Elaine. If you would wait a minute, I, I okay. wonder if there are any uh, questions for Elaine in light of her presentation or the memo? Well, I have some. Uh, okay. Uh, I understand, I mean, I, I understood the logic of the memo, but I also understand that the RB zoning, or, uh, the, the, the rules that are in place, uh, would encourage more dense development in the RB zone and would therefore create the potential for more housing units to go into the RB zone, which basically is, I think, the reason why we call that the growth area. Is that true? Um, to the extent that, yes, in the RB zone, if you have a 10-acre parcel, you can divide it up into more individual pieces than you can in the RA zone. So you could, you could end up with more houses in an RB zone parcel than an RA zone parcel. But the difference is in an RA zone, you would end up with larger lots, but no ability to provide any open space either for the benefit of the owners of the lot in that development or for the benefit of the public where in the RB zone, although you might have a few more houses, you also have the ability to require that surrounding those houses, there be significant amounts of open space. And in many cases, although the ordinance doesn't allow us to require it of a developer, in many cases, as part of the um, process of the developers working with the town, in fact, much of this open space is dedicated to the town and becomes available for public, public use, although we can't require that under the zoning ordinance. Okay, and then my, my next question is, I, I thought when we originally sent this to the planning board, this was largely a housekeeping function in yes. that we did not perceive that there would ever be any development at Turkey Hill Farm or this parcel that's behind uh, Loxley Road in the uh, Sherwood old, Forest. Sh thank you, Sherwood Forest area. So why should we continue to have them designated as growth areas when they're not going to be? Right. That sort of puts our planning off kilter. If you have these areas that are on the map as growth areas when they're really not going to be. So I, I, did the planning board wrestle with that issue at all? And what were your conclusions? We did. In some senses, the zoning of the Turkey Hill parcel is practically irrelevant unless in the almost impossible situation where the beneficiary of the preservation ordinance, which I think is the Cape Land Trust, might agree to release that easement. That seems inconceivable, but it could happen. So in some sense, it's, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. The Lovett Ayers parcel, I would really look at a little differently. It's land owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, there are many circumstances in when, that I can imagine when the town of Cape Elizabeth might look at its inventory of land and decide that it really needs to sell some of that inventory of land. If you look at our current zoning ordinances, 
and there are many reasons why we might want to take a very careful look at those zoning ordinances and tinker with them quite a bit, but as they're currently formulated, in that unlikely but foreseeable situation, um, it really puts the town in the best position to get the best public benefit out of that land, even though the town might choose to sell it. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, Frank. Just, uh, Lane, just going back to that last point, um, if we were to, the Lovett, the Lovett Field area, um, if we were to keep it in the growth area mm -hmm. and the town at some future time decided that it needed to sell it for whatever reason to raise cash, whatever, that would uh, mean that it could be developed where more open space was maintained. Correct. Correct. Um, but I guess there would also be the potential that if the town was trying to truly maximize revenue in the sale, there would be an attempt at some future point to change the zoning and to, in order to maximize the sale proceeds. Is that true too or not? I mean. Well, the town can always change its zoning ordinance, right. um, but it would have to do it in a way that weren't perceived to be spot zoning or in some way inconsistent with the town plan, so there would be some restrictions. But the town can certainly always change its ordinances. So in a sense, um, by not allowing the change now, uh, and keeping it as it is presently zoned, to some degree we're tying the hands of the town in the future, uh, which is much something we want to do, but not definitely permanently controlling what they can do because they could always change the zoning. Correct, correct. Sarah. I'm sorry, can you just explain once again the Turkey Hill Farm agreement they have with South? I actually have not reviewed the specifics of the easement that's on the Turkey Hill Farm. My understanding is that the owner of that parcel has given an agricultural easement to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust that says that that land will in perpetuity be dedicated to agricultural uses. When you have that kind of an easement, the only way to break that easement is for the beneficiary of the easement, which is the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, to agree to release it or in a very unusual circumstance for a court to determine that it was not a reasonable easement and by a matter of law doing it, that seems pretty unlikely in this situation. So the current owner is a joint ownership with Celt and the person or the person who owns Turkey Hill Farm owns it, but eventually it will fall to Celt. How does Celt have any control over its future? Because it owns an easement over the parcel. So if and again, I haven't checked the title to the parcel, but my understanding is that the current owner of the parcel could transfer it to another owner. If it's owned by an individual and that individual were to die and it were to go to that individual's heirs, it would transfer subject to the easement to Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. I don't know whether the land trust has any rights to purchase the property or not. And the easement's the entire property. I, that's my understanding, but again, I have not reviewed it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Elaine. We really okay. appreciate your coming tonight. Um, I have another man. I think I'm on the next item on the agenda, too, but if you... Well, but we may I'll need, come back. We may need you to come back then. Thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, sit close. Um, I mean, it seems to me we have a couple of options here. One would be to set this for a public hearing for next month to make a decision on whether we want to... Uh, rezone these properties from the RB zone or the growth area district to the RA zone, that would be my preference. I, I, the other option, I suppose, is to send it to the ordinance committee, but I feel like this issue has been around the bend and there's a lot of issues on the ordinance committee already. And I, I, I really had viewed this more as a housekeeping issue. It doesn't, for me, make sense, to, with all due respect to the planning board, to keep this uh, in the growth area when we know it's not going to be an area where there is going to be growth. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to make a motion. Caitlin, go ahead. I was just going to say, I understand with the Turkey Hill Farm that the chances are of it ever being in the growth area are very slim, but with the Lovett Farms, it is possible yes. down the line right. that we may want to develop it. And if that's true, and our whole town concept is open space, then preserving open space and developing it, the best way to do that sounds like being in the RB zone. So. We might, the best idea might be to separate Turkey Hill Farm 
and love it. Is it love, I don't know what it's. Love it airs parcel as two separate instead of one. Uh, that that I, uh, excuse me that I did it occur to me. Uh, Mike uh, he was just going to speak to the love it airs parcel. Could I? I wanted to give a little history. If yeah, that might be useful for the council. Okay. Yeah. The, the love it airs parcel. There, there was a the same family that owned Lovett's Field in South Pole, fairly well known, owned this piece of land in Cape Elizabeth. What, what happened was it, it kept getting left to heirs and it, it ended up, you know, someone owned three one hundred and twelfths. And you had all these different pieces of, of fractional ownership. And the, the town acquired one of the fractional ownerships. And then someone else came to us and said, I'd like to donate my fractional ownership. I want this land preserved. The town council then authorized the town to, uh, for Tom Leahy to go out and to look at all the different fractional ownerships and to actually try to figure out what they were and who owned them. We spent thousands and thousands of dollars doing title work, figuring out who, who owned all the fractional ownerships and trying to, uh, to approach them. Uh, we, we approached them. Uh, it, it ended up all of the ones we were able to find, with one exception, gave the land to the town for a, a very small settlement. And we approached them with the understanding, based on the council discussion, that it was going to be conservation land. The reason is this is an 18-acre parcel that connects all of the Stonegate conservation land, all of Robinson Woods, with all of the neighborhoods in the Oakhurst area. This is the key link, the, the, the really key piece. We've worked, uh, and anyway, so we now, and we also then, sent tax bills, we have been for the last few years, you drew, the council at the time directed to send tax bills to the last known address of all of the others who had partial ownership. And we've been working so that with, eventually with foreclosures, we now, just in the last year, have gone up, so a lot of those, the tax foreclosures took, took effect. We now own 97% uh, interest in the property. The one of the holdout party still owns 3%, and we, we communicate with every so often, but they want more than we've been willing to offer them. We've also had discussions with the land trust. They've been very active at trying to work with some of the neighbors off that end of Oakhurst Road to try to get some pedest a pedestrian easement into this property to affect that connection. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried that, cit that citizens in that, that neighborhood might be hearing some of the discussion tonight and think that somehow the council is, is all about trying to get cash uh, and might be looking at developing the parcel. It would be totally contrary to all of the planning and all of the efforts of the town. You know, once we reach the 97%, my intent has always, had always been to come back to the council in, you know, shortly thereafter and to say, let's work with the land trust to give them an easement over our 97% interest in this 100%. That would have happened this year, but I think the council knows there were, there were some other issues we were dealing with the land trust. The timing wasn't good. Uh, there, was, there were just too many other issues going on. You know, to me, it is, it is in the best interest of the conservation purpose of the town to consider that land as conservation land. It's, it would, it's totally in keeping with all of the council discussion and all of the assurances we gave people who worked with us over the years on acquiring those different interests. So, you know, I, I would hope that, the, the, you, know, the, the, you know, the council, yes, you could say, no, we, we want to reverse direction. But, you know, I, I just hate what that thought left without you knowing the background and the history and the assurances that, that were made when we acquired the fractional interest. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. That's very helpful. Anne? Um, I, I was or am a member of the um, ordinance committee that looked at this, and I, I think the three of us knew a lot of the stuff that Mike was talking about and, and also um, considered RB versus RA and growth areas, and we had a lot of extensive conversation and discussion on it. And we voted unanimously to, to move this forward. Then the council voted unanimously to move this forward. I, I, with all due respect to the arguments put forth by the planning board who work very hard, I think these two lots should not be in the RB growth district because I think the RB growth district is promoted as the growth district where we want growth to be directed to. And I don't think we want growth to be directed to these things. Turkey Hill, it's sort of crazy because the reality on the ground is it's permanently protected by this easement with the land trust. So it can't be developed. Um, 
And then, as Mike said, everything we've been working towards is to make this other, uh, the Lovett Ayers parcel, permanently protected. And so it seems to me incongruous to have it placed in the RB zone, um, especially since the RB zone, as I understand it, provides incentives for developers to develop it. So if we, you know, if we, if we kept it in the RB zone, we were say we were, excuse me, sort of directing our uh, developers who might be interested in properties in Cape to develop those properties. And I think that's the exact opposite of what we want to do in a practical sense. So for, that, for those reasons, I would like to recommend that we move both these lots forward um, and uh, I don't know how to word this exactly, but for a public hearing at our next regularly scheduled our, our November um, town council meeting um, and that we not separate them because I, I think although there are slightly different arguments for each one, I really think what we want to do is take them out of the growth area. So, so that's is, my motion. Is that, okay, that's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. A discussion. Caitlin. Just taking them out of the RV growth area doesn't necessarily mean you can't develop them. I mean, there's, they would just move into a different, you know, area that still can be developed. So. I think our next step should be what Mike was saying is if we're going to protect it, then protect it. But if it, as with it unprotected, the best place for it to sit is in the RB growth area because that's what's going to hold the town's best position. Whereas if it's going to be developed, which I'm not saying it's going to, but if it was, the best place for it to be is in the RB where open space can be protected. So until we protect it, that's the best place to keep it for, for right now, is my understanding. If okay, uh, any further discussion on the motion, um, Sarah and just, Ann? Very quickly, I agree with everything Ann said, uh, and I agree also with Caitlin that we should move quickly to expedite the protection. As a practical matter, the, the zoning really doesn't matter because I think it's virtually assured that both of these will be protected. Absolutely. And so I think. I'm not quite sure why we even need a public hearing unless it's a technicality. I think we could just dispatch with this. But, but I agree with Anne that it's very confusing to look at a town map and you see all the yellow, which sort of makes sense, or it makes sense for the comp plan so far, though we haven't finished discussing it. And then you see these two weird parcels. And to me, it's just almost, again, a housekeeping issue that it should be zoned with all the things that are around it, knowing that neither of them will get developed. And so. I agree with both of you, and I think we should just put the thing to rest. Okay, uh, so there's been a, we've had a motion that's been seconded. The motion is to have a public hearing to consider the issue of rezoning these two parcels from uh, RB to RA. There's been a suggestion that perhaps we don't need a public hearing. Is that, is that a technical step that's required? It's required. Sorry, okay. I think it is. Okay. So, so I just, it's been a while since I've done this, but so we have to have the public hearing, then can we vote? at the next meeting? We don't have to wait yet another month to actually vote, do we? We, we need There's to advertise also, it for yeah, two that's, weeks in a newspaper. Right. We need to send notices. Yeah, to notices public. and all the rest, it's all public. We've but we can public. vote at the same meeting that we have the public hearing at. Yes. Okay, thank you. I think the reason we might depart from that is if the, the public hearing caused the council to think it might need to rework the issue like we had with the, the BA zoning amendments a few years ago. But anyway, Frank? I, you can, I think you can agree on both sides of this discussion, because, primarily because there's no, doesn't appear to be any practical consequence of what the uh, zoning is on these two parcels. But there is an implied message, uh, an implied communication about what the zoning is. And I think that's where our focus should really be, uh, what message we're trying to convey in the town to developers. Um, is it that we're in a unique situation here where, where whatever decision we make, won't have any impact on these two properties. <laughs> <laughs> it should all be so easy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the motion is to set this for a public hearing to consider the rezoning of these two parcels. It's been seconded. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number 133, 2011, is a planning board open space impact fee recommendation. Uh, and there is a summary in our materials. Uh, Elaine, would you be willing to uh, give us a brief summary of this? Thank 
this recommendation is really just um, a housekeeping item. In, in the Earlier we were talking about the zoning ordinance. We're now talking about the subdivision ordinance. In the subdivision ordinance, there is another open space provision um, that the, the purpose of which is to make sure that when there is a subdivision and therefore presumably more houses appear in town, that the amount of public open space per household is not diminished so that as you build more houses, you provide more open space so that the amount of open space per household in the town is not diluted. So that's what we're addressing in this part of the subdivision ordinance. To make that happen, there's a formula that you apply. And you do a couple different calculations under the formula. The first calculation is you determine how much open space per household you have in the town. And so this, this is a calculation that varies from time to time because as you have more, more or fewer households in the town, and as you have more or less open space in the town, the amount of open space per household obviously is going to change. So the ordinance provides um, a method of making that calculation. And it's, it's calculated based on the US Census, and that determines how many households are in the town, and by the actual amount of town open space. So every time the town acquires more open space, it has more open space per household, assuming the households remain constant. That calculation, the ordinance requires that that calculation be modified to reflect the current census data. Um, the other part of the calculation provides that um, when land is developed into a subdivision, a developer is required to set aside a certain amount of acreage based on this first open space per household calculation. However, the planning board's given the option of asking the developer or requiring the developer in lieu of giving this acreage, if it's acreage that would not be useful to the town for its open space plan, it's too small, it's, it's not located in a, in a helpful spot, um, to ask the developer instead to make a financial contribution to the town. Those financial contributions so then are set aside in a segregated fund that the town can use for acquiring open space in another location. That calculation also needs to be revised according to the ordinance to reflect the change in the town census data. So since there has been and also changes in the property values in the town. Two things have happened in the town. We have a new census, and we have a now a new townwide valuation. So according to the statute, the town is required to take a look at this calculation. If you take a look at the calculation and redo it, you'll see from the data we've provided that it would require a developer to give the town more land, slightly more acreage per household of new development, and it would result in a higher alternative fee. The, town, the, the planning board's recommendation is basically that, as required by the ordinance, the town go through the steps of making the calculation. The planning board, however, is not recommending that the town necessarily increase the fees or increase the acreage required. We had a lot of discussion on that, and in a sense, we see that more as a policy decision for you to consider. It may or may not make sense at this point to increase the fee associated with the development, either directly through a higher fee schedule or indirectly through requiring a higher set-aside. And under the ordinance, you can do the calculation and then choose to charge a lesser fee. You don't have to charge the maximum fee that you could charge. But what you do have to do is make the calculation and then make the decision. So we're recommending that the calculation be done. 
whether you act on that calculation or not, um, the planning board is not making a recommendation. We would note, however, that this fee has been important in several new um, developments, small developments that have occurred in, ta in town, and the town has achieved some revenue from those that has made a contribution, although not a large one, towards the ability of the, of the uh, town to acquire more open space. On the other hand, making it um, more expensive for landowners to realize value out of their property may or may not be something that the town wants to do at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Elaine. To make sure I understand this, then, this is the calculation that the Planning Board went through in accordance with the ordinance. And it, because of the change in the amount of acres of open space and the census, uh, the, the fee has essentially gone up per this calculation. Is that right? The, the calculation will result in a higher fee also because of the increase in the um, tax valuation of the right. town properties. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, what's the history of the town adjusting the fee and the history of the planning board recommending or not recommending adjustments to the fee? The last time the fee was adjusted, to my knowledge, would have been in the prior census, would have been te which was 10 years ago, and I don't know whether or not the, town count the planning board made any recommendation at that point. The, the town manager could actually speak to yeah. that. The fee was actually established at about the same time, just following the last census. So. It, it uh, essentially came in at about the same time. This whole calculation concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Jim. And Michael, what is the fee today? Okay. Based on the 2000, is it? Uh, 15,000, right? Yeah, I don't recall exactly. Uh, I think I've got it here. Uh, we actually have our resource here up in the council, Caitlin. It's 15,000. Uh, per acre, and then the dollars is $4,320 uh, okay. $4, per lot. And so it's going up to 19850 per acre, and then $6,729 per lot. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Are there any? Yes, Mike. I just, uh, yeah, Mrs. Fa uh, Ms. Fallander mentioned recently that the, the estate of Henry Berry is, is an example. Uh, the family, uh, the estate, uh, didn't you know, want to donate space because of various issues involving that land. And we, we did receive a fee that went into the land acquisition fund of about 15,000, uh, if I recall. The staff, I thought it was 17, but it's, I think it was about I 17. But anyway, you know, the, the staff believes that we shouldn't backslide on our focus on open space and, and, and you know, in the fee. And if you don't keep up with the market conditions of, of housing, you know, you're going to diminish your capacity to acquire open space and to follow the principles that are in the comprehensive plan. Uh, Ann? Uh, and, and, and Frank. I was going to make a motion. Okay. Uh, all right. But I guess we can continue discussion yeah. after it, the motion. It, it is part of the comprehensive plan, is it not, that this be regularly updated? Uh, I believe it is. Okay. The, the ordinance requires it. And, and, mm -hmm. Okay. And then is it, is it the proper policy for the planning board to bring that to us, or is that something that this board should be managing? Uh, it just seems kind of interesting that it's coming from the planning board to us as opposed to the town council addressing it as a matter of business. Yeah, I, There's actually a provision in the ordinance that indicates that the planning board reviews the calculation. So, and so my view is that they've given us the calculation and Elaine has indicated what the planning board might do if it were making the policy decision, but ultimately it's our decision. Yeah, I just I watched that that e that evening discussion, and it was rather interesting because there was a lot of where should this be coming from, and whether it should right. be coming from this group or or from the planning board. I was just looking for some clarity from either the manager or whatever as to where it should be coming from. So. Did, Frank, you had your hand up. You're ready. Okay, Anne, why don't you make? Are you ready to make a motion? I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to um, move that we adopt this new fee of 62, uh, I'm sorry, $6,729 per lot or unit. Second. second. <laughs> Deborah, somebody seconded that. I know, I do. You can, just, you get, you can choose. <laughs> yes. All right, the motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Just to Sarah. clarify, 
So if we want to vote on increasing the fee to keep up with all the new numbers that have come in, we vote yes on this motion. Although the planning board has sort of said here we're presenting the numbers, but actually we're not re recommending it. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Thank you. They're neither for nor against. Yeah, right. They're, they're, they're saying we should no recommendation. Yeah. Right. It's no, you're making no recommendation, right? It's a neutral we, presentation we, of facts. We couldn't come to a uh, consensus on that no. point. So Does the we're... ordinance require a recommendation? No. No. Okay, so it's our decision. Yeah. So we're just voting I don't whether think it matters where it comes from. If it's a prescribed formula, it doesn't matter to me whether we calculate it. They calculate it, whatever. It's a prescribed formula. Right. I, I mean, I, I concur with uh, the town manager's comments. I think we need to keep up with the current numbers and evaluation. So I, I plan to vote for the motion. Are there any more questions or comments before I? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you again for coming Thank tonight. You. We really appreciate it. Uh, item number 134 2011. Consumer Fireworks Regulations. Uh, the Ordinance Committee has been quite busy lately. Uh, and uh, I, Jim, as chair, do you want to give us a well, brief? We took, uh, we, uh, we took it upon ourselves without the direction from the Town Council to take this up at our last Ordinance Committee because we felt that it needed to be addressed. And uh, we had the uh, we had the uh, fire chief with us that day as well, and we had a proposed um, ordinance suggested to us that you see in front of you today. And with the uh, new law going in, uh, in place uh, at the state level to allow for the sale of fireworks here in the state of Maine, we felt it appropriate for us to, um, to have an ordinance uh, brought forth and uh, put in the books. And therefore, the first step is to present it to us, and then for us to go to hearing, and then get public input and make whatever decisions to be done. But it's very straightforward. It's patterned after what's going on in other communities mm -hmm. in the immediate area. And uh, we would recommend that the board move this to a hearing. Okay. In light of that, Jim, do you have a motion? I move that the uh, Consumer Fireworks Regulation that is proposed here tonight be moved to a public hearing to be held on November 14th, 2011. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion or questions? I do note that we have both the fire chief and the police chief here tonight. Thank you all for coming. I, I think, though, given the time of the meeting, we may just want to move this question forward and uh, welcome your input at the public hearing uh, next month. Um, sorry if you... Uh, fire chief. <laughs> Police chief does want a couple. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All those in favor of the motion? Okay. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number 135, 2011, another uh, agenda item from the Ordinance Committee uh, relating to the regulation of rooster owners. Uh, Jim, again, would you like to yeah. give us a brief background? Thanks to the chair to uh, get the audience committee to start turning some, uh, some recommendations over. But, uh, so we have the roosters uh, uh, in front of you. This was referred by the town council to the planning board back in... I see any roosters. Yeah. Uh, on August... Uh, you, nice. That's great. It's getting late. Uh, and this was um, referred by the town council to the planning board back in August of 2010. And... Um, the planning board held four workshops and two public hearings on the subject uh, before recommending that the existing ordinance be amended to address noise. Uh, the ordinance committee received public comments uh, after you sent it back to us to look at, um, who raised chickens and people who live next to roosters and reviewed restrictions in other communities. We heard recommendations from the code enforcement officer as well as to the uh, police chief who is here tonight who, um, given the opportunity, would, would probably want to speak to the subject because we did have some good discussion. Um, we are recommending that the miscellaneous offense ordinance be amended to apply noise restrictions to n roosters and other animals. Um, the, uh, basically what we had determined was the residents in the town have no recourse under the current ordinance when roosters make noise and disrupt the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of their homes. While we don't believe this is a perfect answer. We believe it's the right uh, approach to strike a balance between uh, 
uh, what we're asking for in the quiet enjoyment of, of people's uh, homes. Uh, the, uh, we believe ultimately uh, if we have more complaints, we may have uh, to address this differently uh, in terms of uh, addressing roosters just in, as a matter of fact here in Cape Elizabeth or by lot size. But this, we believe, is the right balance uh, given all the inputs we've received from all, of, all the participants in the process. So I would recommend. Are, are you moving? Moving. OK. Yes. Um, <laughs> recommend that we propose, we propose an amendment to the mis miscellaneous offenses ordinance that regulate rooster owners. It's recommended that this go to public hearing on Monday, November 14th, 2011. So could I it's ask you to rephrase to your motion? Ordinance. Though, because your motion was actually had two parts in it. One okay. was sort of recommending approval of this ordinance, and the next was a public hearing. Would you just I, actually I think, move? I think he meant the ordinance committee was recommending. Oh, I see. Ordinance not, sorry. Not recommending that, that we were recommending a proposed, a proposed amendment to the miscellaneous offense ordinance that would regulate roosters. Um, and it's recommended to go to a public hearing. Okay. Sorry. I'm Second. sorry, I wasn't, I may have misheard. The motion Second. made and seconded. Second the public hearing. Uh, Caitlin. I just had a question. Voting no would be to send it, not send it to a public hearing, which would make the issue dead. Uh, that would be. That would kill it. Yeah. That would kill it, okay. yes. Just want to clarify the vote. And even if we vote to send it to a public hearing, it doesn't mean necessarily that yeah, the council member the favors issue. the right. the amendment. But can I just ask one question before we have a vote on the motion? And was there any consideration for an exemption for farm owners? Uh, that exists already. Is there? Does that exist in the ordinance? Agricultural is allowed. Yeah, it's allowed. Uses are allowed right. in all yeah. zones. The right to farm. And if, and in fact, that are at the. Okay, I just let me. We had, we had some there complaining about a rooster on the farm that they live next to. Right. And we pointed out at the meeting that they live next to a farm and it's exempted. This rule, this would not make any impact. I, I just reading this in a vacuum, I had that concern. So right. thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay. Motion carries five to one. Uh, item 136, 2011 rescue unit staffing. Uh, we had a workshop on this issue earlier uh, this month, and uh, the recommendation that we discussed was to authorize the town manager to develop enhanced rescue staffing with per diem personnel, as described in our memo from September 23rd. Uh, we did have a, a pretty lengthy discussion about this at the workshop. Uh, is there a motion? Dan. I'd like to move that we. Uh Authorize the town manager to develop an enhanced rescue staffing plan with per diem personnel as described in our September 23rd, 2011 memo. Funds will be provided through the Rescue Special Revenue Fund. Second it. Motions been made and seconded. We, we do have the fire chief here. Uh, Peter, did you want to speak at all on this issue? I'm sorry, I should have done that before the motion. As part of the budget, the, the current budget that we're in, we discussed the, the need to address staffing at some point. Uh, Council Jordan raised the issue again. We looked at numbers in August. Uh, the, num the trend is still continuing that we are, uh, particularly during the daytime, having issues with prompt response to calls. We've increased the number of times we've had to ask for the fire companies to assist the rescue. We've increased the calls to South Portland to provide paramedic coverage and even in some cases transport because we couldn't feel the crew. So because of all the demands, and you're all very familiar, we discussed it in the workshop, the increased demands on the people, I think you're seeing it in everything, be it Little League, be it ice hockey, whatever, the youth football, that people are less prone to volunteer because of other time commitments. And it's really put a burden on our people. Just to be a basic EMT is a 120-hour course, plus you have to do training and you have to do recertification every three years. A paramedic now is a two-year college degree. Uh, we're just not seeing, as our older volunteers um, sort of retire, we're not seeing people coming in to step up and take that place. Uh, the level of pre-hospital care has risen. What the hospitals expect for us before we turn the patient over to them is, is increased. And we need that paramedic coverage to provide that 
you know, the EKG and the 12 lead inflammation the, to be able to push the drug. So um, what we're proposing is to staff at this point the rescue during the day with one per diem paramedic. Uh, and about 50% of our calls occur between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., that range. So it's sort of a progression to take that burden off. Our, our daytime response really rests on the, on the shoulders of a couple of people. And if those people are missing or committed elsewhere, then we really struggle to field a crew. And this will address that issue. Uh, it will certainly have to, we'll have to keep an eye on it because I think as we progress further and further that, you know, we may have to look at 24 hour coverage. So certainly that would come at some point down the line. I do want to mention that we have a very active volunteer or paid on call rescue that has served this community for about 50 years and done a very good job, but the demands on them has risen. And we are probably, to the best of my knowledge, we're the only community in, in the greater Fulton area that does not have full time or per diem staffing for our ambulance. So that's a credit to that group that we have survived as long as we have. But I think it's just becoming too much of a burden. And, you know, an ambulance call used to be an hour or so, and now it's in the two hour, two and a half hour range. And that's just, you know, in, an increased demand. And so when you hear that call come in, you have to, you have the two, two and a half hours to commit to that transport. And that's just become a burden on those people. And this is not to say that once we have this person in place, the other people will still need them to respond. We still need someone to drive the ambulance. And if it's a basic transport call, that paramedic can stay in town and the you know, intermediate or the basic EMT can provide the transport. Thank you. Are there any questions for Peter? Okay. I, do, uh, I, I just Mike. want to thank Peter and, and the, the members of the committee that looked into this and, and really all the members of the rescue for uh, you know, this you know, could have been very traumatic if it was proposed a few years ago. And yeah. I think, you know, the, the, the timing, the time has come. Yeah. Yeah, and I <clears throat> echo Mike's comments. Thank you for all of your work on this issue. Uh, Caitlin? Um, I just wanted to thank everyone and anybody who has time to respond to any calls. And I hope that we can continue to review, you know, any policies we can to make it the most effective and efficient rescue, you know, unit that we can have. So I thank you for looking into it. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Oh, Sarah, did you want to comment? I forgot we'd made a motion. Oh, okay. We did make a motion. All right. The motion's I, I made and sure seconded. Uh, uh, yeah. it, and it was to uh, approve the town manager to authorize enhanced rescue staffing with per diem personnel as described in the memo dated September 23rd. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? All right, thank you. Motion carries. Item 137, 2011, the fund balance policy. Uh, it is, we, we had, we've actually now had two workshops on this issue uh, to update the Town of Cape Elizabeth fund balance policy. I believe it's been thoroughly discussed at the workshops. Uh, Ann. I have a motion. I move <laughs> that we adopt the uh, fund, fund balance policy as outlined in uh, our agenda and the memo dated July 12th. Seconded. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Item 138-2011, uh, General Assistance Guidelines. Uh, the proposal is we schedule a public hearing on the annual update of General Assistance Guidelines for Monday, November 14th at 7.30. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. November 14th is looking, shaping up to be a busy uh, agenda. Uh, item 139, 2011, the public safety message board sign. Uh, there is a policy, proposed policy set forth in our materials as to the use of the public safety message board sign. Uh, is there a motion? And I move that we adopt the new uh, policy on the use of the public safety message board sign as outlined on our agenda. A second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion or questions? Yes, Jim. Uh, how will this be um, communicated to the community? I know that we have folks that, that have asked about it, and will we just put it on our website, or is that the? We'll do that. OK. <laughs> Frank said we should sound put it very on the sign. Enthusiastic. <laughs> no, no, we're happy to do it. We'd be happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and just uh, for those who may be watching, uh, 
uh, one of the changes is that the sign would be used within seven days of any regular or special election to alert citizens about the dates and location of election day voting. So that will be done for every election, whether it's a regular one or a special one. And Unless we will have enough. Unless by safety concerns. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? All right, it carries unanimously. Item 140-2011, the fair hearing officer appointment. Uh, we have a proposal to appoint uh, Michael Valancourt to a new three-year term as the fair hearing officer. That term would expire December 31, 2014. Jim, do you have a motion? I'd like to um, propose that we appoint Michael Valancourt to a new three-year term as our fair hearing officer. Second, with gratitude to Michael Valancourt. <laughs> Any discussion? Mike. Just wanted to briefly say, we did run this by Jessica Sullivan as the chair of the Ordinance Committee, as the chair of the Appointments Committee, you know, discussion whether or not it needed to go to that committee. She felt it didn't. So I just wanted to, to indicate that for the record, since she's not here. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, second and last opportunity for citizens to uh, discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. If anybody would like to discuss an item not on the agenda, you are welcome to do so now. Okay, seeing no one coming forward. Uh, item 141-2011, a request for executive session uh, to consider a hardship abatement. Is there a motion, Anne? I move that in conformance with 1 MRSA section 4056F that we enter executive session to review a request for a hardship abatement. Second. And before we have the vote, we will, after we come out of executive session, we will come out and uh, then officially adjourn the meeting. But the motion now is to go into executive se session. Uh, all those in favor? The motion carries. Thank you. If anyone wants to find out the vote, they can call me. Okay, thank you.